Welcome to Out Talks, a video and podcast bringing you stories and news of queer people and allies across the globe. I'm Nazia Saeed, the Arabic Media Coordinator, and for today's episode, I'm talking to Tashi Shatin, and uh, the director of Rainbow uh, Potin, and Nam Zam, a multimedia journalist and executive director of, John, uh, of Journalist Association of Bhutan. Welcome to our talks. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for the participants who joined us to listen and to talk and to share with us uh, this um, webinar. In December 2020, and specifically on the International Human Rights Day, the parliament this, this decriminalized same-sex sexual activity. The panel code article 213 and 214 had previously stated that same-sex sexual acts are punishable by prison sentence of between one month to less than one year. Ashley, would you explain to us the efforts that made that happen in your tiny Himalayan kingdom? <coughs> Uh, thank you, Nazia, for having us. Uh, yeah, I think uh, for the fact that we are a very tiny nation also helped uh, because apparently <laughs> being small uh, right now really, uh, gave us advantage of knowing people on a very personal level. So it was not uh, really of an organization or a group coming together and uh, protesting or asking for change. It was a uh, small, tiny things that people actually did, people, al our allies actually did, the community actually did that made it happen. And uh, for us to achieve that uh, in, within the span of five years uh, is even uh, surprising for me, even for me itself. Uh, <laughs> frankly, when I started uh, with this movement, I thought we would at least take a decade or so just to have this decriminalization, but it happened uh, within uh, five years. and. Frankly, I'm really grateful that we had strong allies, allies like Tamizam and the finance minister who actually uh, proposed decriminalization in the first place. Uh, and thanks to those uh, we are here right now talking about uh, decriminalization in Bhutan. So what kind of efforts that came together? Was it like uh, you, you work on, uh, on uh, uh, parliament level or was it media level or all together? Uh, I think it was uh, more of uh, all together. Uh, frankly, we, when we started we back in 2014, 15, we neither had the skills nor the, nor the capacity to do a large level advocacy or uh, awareness campaign for the parliament. And uh, frankly, we were very scared of people in the upper positions, but we, uh, we started very small uh, in, in context of HIV. We started talking about HIV, the whole uh, MSM and transgender issues coming together. We talked about policy change, how it affected the health. Uh, basically, the health was our uh, move. Uh, uh, actually, Minister of Health actually gave us the chance to talk about all, all these issues. And after uh, now two, three years into this whole uh, HIV thing, then we started talking about LGBT issues, not on a very large scale, but we did uh, small advocacies. We talked to people, people who were actually in uh, position or in power to do. It was not much of a uh, 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 like a workshop, advoca uh, workshop advocacy or such. It's more like one-to-one -one person uh, gaining, uh, like building a rapport with people. So telling our stories, storytelling actually helps. So that's how we achieve stuff. Uh, if you look at Bhutan's uh, history with Pride, we never had a Pride March. And uh, I said it before in few interviews, uh, we may never have a Pride March. Uh, but then uh, small steps like advocacy, uh, telling our stories on a very personal level uh, to those people who are actually listening to us, it actually helped. So it was very small, just, uh, like, uh, like you said, it's, uh, it's very tiny efforts that we took uh, and it really paid off. Great. Namjay, what was the role of the allies and the media in this regard? What do you think? I think, um... If you were to separate the two, before the allies, I would say that um, the media came in. Uh, I remember even before I wrote the first uh, long form story to ever come out of Bhutan and um, to have ever been uh, published by the uh, national broadcaster, um, there were uh, 
um, there were a few reports in the media that were more statistical than human. Like there were hardly any human stories. Like Tashi would agree with me. Just numbers of people, like he was saying, it was people working with HIV. So you even had this literal this terminology. They would call it MSM. <laughs> it's like men having sex with men. It's like more like a medical term that they used. And homosexuality. We didn't even talk about LGBTIQ. Like Bhutanese are still uh, familiarizing themselves uh, with this um, with this uh, terminology. And uh, so then there were these two, three, maybe about like a. Uh, 550, 600 maximum word pieces that will come out in the print media and never before had the national broadcaster covered anything related to the LGBTIQ population in Bhutan. So then it was in 2014, I think, that I did this uh, really lengthy piece on um, the queer population in Bhutan and uh, really highlighting their story. And I think that story resonated with a lot of young Bhutanese, including Tashi's partner, Pema, who prior to that had never really known that he thought he was the only one, I think, in Bhutan, and Tashi would agree with me. Um, I remember that we were at a bar, and he comes up to me at the bar, gets a common friend to introduce himself to me and say, you know that he's so grateful that there was something like that in the media, because prior to that, he didn't, uh, and a lot of young Bhutanese at that point were just, um, I mean, High Five wasn't very popular here in Bhutan, we were talking about 2014, so Facebook wasn't big as well, so social media content, even YouTube wasn't big, so a lot of Bhutanese, young Bhutanese didn't know where to find people like themselves or find content that would um, um, be affirmative of their personalities and identities. So with that in the media, then we had the allies come out after that. Like, you know, I was very publicly an ally, very vocal. And then we had other people too who decided that they wanted to speak up, not as many as we do now. I think 2020 was... Um, like a turning point for the whole LGBTIQ movement in Bhutan. So we have, we now see so many new LGBTI accounts being created almost every other day on Instagram, on Facebook. Uh, but prior to that, like Tashi was saying, it was really more in clusters that you would have conversations, in clusters that you would have allies. Um, I think also, and people would assume that, you know, people didn't even have, they couldn't understand what being an ally meant as well. They, um, for instance, I was thought of as being bisexual or lesbian, like belonging to the queer population because I was so vocal in my support of um, the LGBTIQ <laughs> population. And Tashi and I'll know that as well. And I was like, I wish I was because then I'd be even more vocal. It's too bad that I'm a straight person. So I can only do like things at this level. You know, if I was queer, I would do even more things. Um, so, but in the media and allies really went hand in hand. Um, and of course, we have our queer friends as well. Um, we, in a way, worked in different spheres, but we worked together, I think, to be where we are today. Great. We are really happy to have uh, people like you supporting the, the movement supporting the LGBTIQ community, at least in your country. And also, um, uh, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's appreciated around, around, the, around the world as well. Um, Tashi, what, what is the situation now for the queer community in Bhutan? Mm. Um. I'm not so sure because the COVID happened and everyone is in their home. So, <laughs> what about uh, the visibility? But then again, maybe uh, uh, Namge Nam talked a little bit about it. Yeah, uh, I think people are uh, more open about it. Uh, I think young, especially young people, they're more open to coming out uh, within their uh, uh, sphere of friends, the circle of friends. Uh, like I, like Tamgi would say, they would share their stories, they would write stories, they would write poems about uh, the coming out and who are uh, dedicated to the uh, queer community. Um, in terms of uh, the situation, I think uh, uh, Bhutan, uh, I would always tell people that Bhutan is not a bad place to be uh, in terms of uh, being an LGBT person, uh, uh, even in Asia. But then uh, because we had that law before, uh, it... Uh, it gave a sense of not belonging to the community where I saw a few of my friends would actually, uh, uh, we, had the, we would have this conversation uh, where they would want to run away to other countries just because they did not feel belonged, just because the law existed. Now, uh, because the law has gone out, I think people are more opening up about themselves. Uh, they are doing more research on their own and there are a lot of resources online available online to do uh, research. And when I started out, 
uh, there was nothing actually. So when I started out <laughs> way back in 2013, uh, when I Googled LGBTI in Bhutan, that law came out, it said uh, being LGBTI is a criminal in Bhutan. It did not help at all though. Mm. Uh, but then uh, we would read stories and articles uh, wrote by Nam Yuzam and we would get inspired. I, I've never thought that I would be friends with Nam Yuzam way back then. <laughs> but then uh, this, this movement, there was something that connected us and I'm glad that uh, we got connected. And I think uh, from here on, the situation will only improve. Uh, and because we have visibility, uh, there are always fears of, uh, I always have this fear that when we have so much visibility, there will always be someone who will uh, try to oppress. Uh, I will not oppress is a very strong word. They, um, I would say oppose us in some way or the other. We still do have people commenting on our Facebook posts that uh, they support giving a, a I would say not nasty comments on the Facebook, but that's something that we manage on our own. Tashi. Tashi. I think he's frozen, must be his internet connection. I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, we should wait for him to come back. Right, uh, this happens so often in Bhutan. Oh yeah, he's back. You were gone, <laughs> and the last few words. You were gone, you were frozen. Can you hear me? I don't think he can. Has she, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, have, I have more questions, but maybe when, when he can, he, can you hear me, Tashi? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry I got disconnected. <laughs> Don't worry, yeah, it happens, it happens. So uh, you were saying at the end of your um, um, of your talk that you were controlling the comments? Mm, yeah, uh, that was something that we can actually do on our Facebook page that we would not let other people uh, see those comments, we would delete them, we would ban those people, but uh, this, is, this is something that we do on a very, uh, very micro level, but uh, major concern is that we may not be prepared if it comes out at a larger, if we face homophobia or biphobia at the larger level. It's not something that we are anticipating uh, at the earliest, but it's a risk that we have. Well, uh, can I just, can you put us like in the, in the whole picture? If, if we can see that there is some in the media, at least when, when it started, that they are allies. There's also some, some people in the government. Now the, the law <laughs> did, uh, like improved because uh, decriminalization is not anymore there. So how about the society? How's the society taking it? Like, is it normal to have um, LGBTIQ around you or LGBTIQ um, kids? Or is it like hush hush and and uh, it's stigmatized and stuff like this? I, I would like to um, you to answer it, please. Yeah. So Tashi, can you go um, Yeah, in my personal opinion, I think it's too early to anticipate that. But uh, uh, when when I when we were working way back, we would have uh, yeah, we would have allies, um, and we would have friends who would be supportive. But uh, we would also have friends who would say that I wouldn't be able to accept. Uh, uh, their child if they came out as LGB, LGB or T or I, and they, but they have no problems, uh, uh, their friends being that. So we still do that, have that. And I, and I think this is something that we have to tackle on our own as a society. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when we do, uh, when you talk about uh, our issues and we do more, more of advocacy, uh, uh, things do not change at, 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 the, at, at the earliest. It takes time, it takes, and you have to, uh, also uh, give the parents or give the society a chance to understand us an opportunity and it create visibility, create awareness uh, so that uh, things uh, don't go bad for their, uh, things don't go bad for other people. And I think this is a process, um, how the society would react is yet to see, but I think uh, we wouldn't be facing uh, a very severe form of uh, homophobia or, or biphobia mm -hmm. or transphobia in the country, but there is uh, behind the closed doors or uh, behind your back, people would often talk about it. And I think this is uh, normal for a human. <gasps> Namge, what, what do you think? I think uh, like um, Tashi was saying, homophobia is not extreme or violent in Bhutan. Um, I mean, we've had 
uh, several years of the word, uh, the word I want to use is tolerance. <laughs> and, uh, but I think we want more than that now. And I don't think it's selfish to want that. I think it's a basic human right to want a dignified life for my friends who are LGBTIQ. And um, I think when you are lesbian or if you are gay, um, you, I mean, you still physically look like a hetero person. So you are not discriminated against publicly, but I think it's more difficult for our trans friends, uh, the trans men, the trans women are, it's physically visible that um, they might be, they might not be exactly what you think they are. And I think they uh, tend to face, like Tashi was saying, I think quite a bit of discrimination. I hear from the queer, from Tashi and from, uh, I mean, at Rainbow Bhutan and Queer Voice Bhutan, how trans women get, especially trans women, like there seems to be a greater acceptance for trans men, like they call toms and oh it's okay with girls being boyish maybe a lot of people think it's a phase they're going to grow out of but I think there's lesser acceptance when you are a trans woman and I think uh, they get discriminated against almost on a daily basis wherever they go I mean they don't really have a lot of safe spaces so I think that we need to change but um, we've had like our first publicly trans woman appear in like a Putinese movie she's also extremely popular in the capital but she's popular because she's a trans woman and uh, people are like, oh, she's different. Uh, we know her, she's different and she's known for being different. Uh, but people don't seem to, I mean, you know, it's like how you and I, if, uh, I mean, if you are straight people, we're going somewhere, people don't stare at you so much like they would a trans woman. So discrimination for them is still uh, very, very obvious. Uh, when it comes to family, like in Bhutan, like we were saying, homophobia is not extreme, but it's easier for people who identify as queer to come out to their friends. Um, so you have a lot of young queer people coming out to their friends, finding support among the friends and not coming out to their families. Um, it's like the family will be the last one that you come out to, like Tashi was saying, it's okay support everybody as long as they are our friends they are our cousins but I don't know if I can support them if they are my family or like my child so we have that we have that difficulty here in Bhutan. Well um, I think trans, trans people around the world are the most vulnerable and the ones and the non-binaries because they are breaking all the um, like the normalization of, of yeah, gender the, the and stereotypes. Yeah. yeah, and especially in a yeah. patriarch system, you know, as you said, uh, to be a trans man, it's okay, but to be a trans woman, it's not okay. Because you are <laughs> downgrading yourself instead of, you know, upgrading to a man. So uh, this is the the the, uh, this is the struggle that we have in this, but the whole patriarch system that we need to fight. And I'm gay. With, that take us to the next question. Actually, that uh, like, what else need to be done for for the safety and dignity of a queer community in, in your country? I think we need to use our hetero privilege to speak up for our friends who are queer because we have more access to more platforms, more spaces than the queer community. And I think we, um, this is what allies need to do. And uh, if you're talking about allies in the media now, if it's besides just being a normal ally, but if you are a journalist ally, um, to tell stories where we don't only victimize, like tell stories of victimhood, right? Tell empowering stories, dignified stories, stories of queer people who are successful in what they do, a very uh, life affirming story. So I always say this to my friends as well. And I think that is the next step for us, especially with decriminalization of homosexuality, same sex relations in Bhutan. I think the next step is to um, see how much more can we make their stories life affirming? How much more can we make it, make it normal? Um, so then let's see, I think we just need to tell these stories more and more so that it becomes as normal as a heterosexual story. So that's the next thing. Yeah, and Hashi, do you think you can achieve that with advocacy and spreading awareness, especially it's a small country? Definitely, like Tashi was saying, like we didn't think, right? In this lifetime, we'd be like <laughs> this. We would experience, we would see decriminalization and sections two and three and two and four removed. So, if that's possible, it's definitely possible to change the narrative of the queer community. What do you think? Uh, that yeah, I. I <laughs> I agree with Namgizam. Uh, it, it has to be a continuous effort, uh, especially advocacy and awareness. And it has to change with time and it has to be adaptive to the people that you are dealing with. Um, and I, I agree that uh, one form of advocacy and one form of uh, 
uh, one form of awareness does not work for everyone. So you have to adapt your advocacy strategies and the way you do it on a very uh, uh, on a very personal level, and that works. Uh, the changes may not be very immediate, but uh, uh, when you do one person at a time, if, even if you can change one person at a time, you can help one family do that. And I think that's the best we can do right now. And I, um, yeah, and I think that this is this should be a continuous process. And I think it will be a continuous process for everyone here. Yeah. Great, great. And uh, our hearts with you and uh, our support as well. And advocacy definitely needs uh, time and sometimes as uh, as uh, Namgay yeah. said, well, we don't we don't see it happening in our lifetime but sometimes it, does. <laughs> sometimes it does you know it's a work of 5 10 20 years sometimes but sometimes it does i would like to invite our uh, participants and the and the webinar if there is any questions if you can if you have any questions you can write them in the chat to so for our speakers for Namge or for Tashi, we are happy to take uh, these questions. Until then, uh, I also have a, 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 one more question. Like Tashi, what? Like, are you in touch or are you uh, building an ally with other Asian countries, for example, or Far East countries to also like to uh -huh. be more powerful? You know, to to have a, a like a queer power in the region. Uh, uh, I actually sit on uh, two uh, regional organizations. Uh, one is ILGA Asia, uh, the uh, International Lesbian Gay Association, part of uh, Asia, and YVC, which is the uh, Youth Voices Count. Uh, we are a, uh, um, I think Asia is only LGBTI regional uh, uh, civil society. So I sit on both the boards, uh, and I think uh, it's uh, it has been quite empowering uh, for me and the people I work with. But uh, I also make a, a point to uh, ensure that uh, my values and my beliefs and my cultural identities don't get affected by the whole regional dialogues and all, uh, whatever happen is happening in the region. Uh, and we do it, in, do it in a very sensitive way because um, uh, whenever we work, uh, because we have to work in our own country, right? Regardless whether I go to, uh, uh, say, India or Nepal or China to get trained on queer identities, I have to come back to Bhutan and do advocacy with my own people, with my own community and with my own society. So uh, I tend to be uh, more aware about uh, this kind of issues. So I think it helps. Um, uh, it's good to be, uh, good to have connections and uh, have allyship in the region. It amplifies your voices and it does give you a space to grow uh, in a very creative way. Uh, it really does help. Yeah, and Amge, do you think uh, do you think like this uh, being an ally with uh, with different uh, countries or different ac uh, activists around around the, your country? Also, now with this discriminalization uh, uh, law, is it like gonna affect the region? Gonna affect at least your you know neighboring countries that also they can take this uh, uh, this uh, step forward? I think we were, um, how do I say it? Legally, we are quite behind. Now, if you were to look at our immediate neighbors, like <laughs> India and Nepal, right? Like they've done so much legally, but like uh, society wise, I think, uh, like I was saying, there seems to be a higher level of acceptance. Like people are not going to not let you rent a flat because it's two men living together or two women living together. So, um, or if it's trans women, like I think Tashi, right? Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but like people will <laughs> rent you out these places, even if you may identify as somebody being queer. So um, I think the biggest impact for me personally is when I first started writing the story in 2014, when there was such a gap on um, queer stories, <laughs> uh, Wikipedia would pop up and they would say that, oh, you know, homosexuality is criminal in Bhutan. And um, anybody who wants to come to Bhutan, like I remember there was an American an exchange student who was in he was like he came here thinking like you know it would be like a really strict like you know the horror stories that you hear from <laughs> right he was really worried that he would get stoned or something would happen and he comes in he's like okay this is not the ground reality in Bhutan like it <laughs> might look like really scary in black and white but as a society we are quite um, like I was saying there seems to be a space for queer people it's just that now we need to own it right all of our queer friends need to own it that is <laughs> 
change that has happened. And um, I, we've had, you know, actually in the past, like tourists who are gay traveling into Bhutan and mm-hmm. having a completely successful itinerary. Like they're living together and there's been public display of affection and no consequence whatsoever. So I think for me, um, the whole legal, there's like a legal impact. I don't know how much of an impact we will have on the region, but just the fact that the decriminalization has happened, like the whole black and white change has happened. I think even mentally, like uh, for people in Bhutan, like things, there's like, we've all made a pivot. Like it was a pivotal moment um, that happened and we'll definitely see a lot more happening. Just you were saying, we're never going to make the news for a pride march in Bhutan. That's never happening because it isn't like a Bhutanese thing to do. Like we don't march in the streets. <laughs> I would definitely march in Nepal. But I mean, imagine Tenshi, right? Like I don't march for women's rights or whatever. Like it's just something we don't do in Bhutan. So um, that's why because of that, like we don't see a queer march happening. Not because it's queer and it will never happen. We don't march for women. We don't march when we're happy. We don't, we, we might like walk or run a marathon, like all together marathon, but then not a match. So I don't know if it would have so much of an impact, but I'm hoping that the stories that come out over the next couple of months, years, may inspire maybe smaller countries, Buddhist countries, uh, because we're so Buddhist here as well, and maybe smaller Hindu communities, maybe we'll have a spillover effect in the bordering um, towns of West Bengal, which is like our immediate border to Bhutan. So really, I think at a more micro level than at a macro level, but let's see, let's, we were just waiting for something positive, more positive things to happen. <laughs> that sounds very interesting. I can't wait to see all these changes. Well, uh, we are coming to the end of, of this talk and I don't see any questions from the participants here. I would uh, give you the last uh, words. Uh, Tashi, do you have anything to say at the end? Um, well, uh, I think at the end, first of all, uh, <laughs> thank you for having us. Uh, and this is a part of our awareness, awareness and advocacy work. Uh, uh, we do this uh, small talks with, uh, with everyone because it helps, uh, even if it uh, may not help on a very large scale, but it does help on a very small uh, even if it helps someone individually, it really works. And this is something that we do. Um, and I think for Bhutan, uh, one last thing I would like to say is that um, it's not a bad place to be uh, LGBTI. That's the, <laughs> regardless of whatever you read on the legal terms. Uh, yeah. Um, I, will, I will come back to you and I'm for the last words, but actually we have a question. So we have a question from Konva. And the question is, could you describe the social scene uh, for queer people in Bhutan? Maybe you, you tackle it a little bit. There must be an online presence, chat sites, etc. cetera. Hmm. she's gone. Um, you would be best. Yeah, I'm here, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, that's the saddest part of uh, queer visibility, I would say. So we, uh, I've heard of, uh, we, I, I have friends who use apps like Grindr and uh, Smurfs and certain like this, but it's not very popular here. People make fake accounts on Facebook so they connect one to one. That's how it really happens. Uh, sometimes it, it may be very risky for people, but uh, that's the only way it happens. Uh, socializing, uh, I think a uh, few queer people, they come together, they get along, but not on a very large scale. And we really have uh, no queer spaces. Uh, we don't have clubs, we don't have bars. Uh, we don't even have a cafe dedicated to, we don't even have an LGBTI office right now, although one of, uh, one of them is in the process. So social spaces, as long as it's personal, I think it is there. Even I uh, get together with my friends, we would make this uh, momos. Uh, <laughs> you would, uh, everyone would chip in and we would eat. <laughs> So uh, this is something that uh, we do uh, on a very large, uh, on a very societal, I would say queer species are invisible in the country. So that's one of the challenges that we have. And um, it does impact a lot of uh, queer people who want to come out and experience the queer culture in Bhutan, which is, uh, uh, I would say, invisible right now. Um, I would like to ask about how popular is the dating apps between queer people? 
Uh, I've seen a, a foreigner who, a tourist who actually come in, use, uh, but that's only, um, I would say two to three pers- uh, two to three people. Uh, queer apps are not at all popular here. Uh, Grindr is, uh, I'd, I'd say maybe two or three people would use it, but I have not seen uh, anyone use queer. So they, so they bounce back from places to place. They would, uh, uh, from Facebook to Instagram, to WeChat, to WhatsApp, to Grindr. So, I don't know, they keep on changing places and spots. And we don't have a social uh, presence in Bhutan, neither we do have a physical presence. <laughs> so yeah, that's one of the issues that we have. Yeah. Well, uh, before I, go, I come back to you, Namge, for the last word, we have a Claudio writing. You have already answered all the possible questions I had. Um, keep up the amazing work for the LGBTIQ community <laughs> in Bhutan. And thank you so much uh, to Nam Gezam for being such a great ally. We would need more journalists <laughs> like you in the West too. <laughs> thank you. And yeah, the word is you. yours, Nam Gay. Oh, I, before, before I say what I have to say, I wanted to share, you know, you're talking about dating apps. It's not popular even among <laughs> heterosexual people. And you know why? Because everybody knows everybody here. So then if they find you in a dating app, they're going to be judging you. <laughs> They're like, oh my God, so even straight people are not opening Tinder or anything in Bhutan. So even <laughs> you can imagine why the queer community is not using this. Um, but for me, I think the next step, and I've been like, it's not really pressure, but I've been pushing Tashi and his partner to try and apply for a marriage certificate. <laughs> so we were like, of course, like we do have these really archaic laws and the marriage act that ha- needs updating. It hasn't been updated since the 1990s. Um, but I want that to be a reality because I know their personal story and I know how difficult it is for queer couples to um, have legal access to anything, be it property, if they want to travel abroad together uh, for further studies, you need to recognize, like you need that legal recognition of a partner. So, I mean, I know a lot of people think I'm extremely radical when it comes to, <laughs> a lot of people progressive they call me a radical and they're like, you're so westernized, leave your western ideas outside. But I really want like, to be able to see my queer friends who I love, um, like, you know, their love be recognized legally. And I think personally for me, that is a goal. Uh, I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime, but that is definitely like my next um, very like, concrete goal and something I want to work towards. And I want to be there for my friends. And if there are allies who are watching this, I just want to let you know that, you know, like whenever Tashi and his partner Pema asked me to do something for the queer community, I never say no. Uh, I think uh, an ally's responsibility, um, I think it is to always be there for your queer friends when they need you and um, to always stand up and speak up for them. Well, Namge, we are, we, they are lucky to have you and also we are, we are lucky as, as a whole community around the world to have allies like you. Well, Tashi thank you. and Namge, thank you for talking and uh, for taking the time to speak with us today and uh, to to share all the experience of uh, your country and decriminalization and what's the next steps. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you for the participation. Take care, everyone. Well, (laughs) take care. This was Naziha Saeed, the Arabic media coordinator at Outright. Follow our weekly talks on our social media channels and see you soon.